Hi, everyone. Welcome to Real Talk, the realities of being and becoming an IBCLC. I'm Angela Lovzarenka, Program Director. And hello, I'm Sakita Lewis-Johnson, the Accredited Provider Program Director for LER. And thank you for joining us and welcome. A little bit about ourselves. I am a board certified lactation consultant. I have been working both in the community as well as hospital based in a private practice for over 30 years. How about you, Sakita? Oh, I am a board certified family nurse practitioner in an IBCLC in birth doula. I have um, extensive work in the hospital setting as well as serving my community in private practice. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to be here. Great, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, yes. so we have, in other words, in order to ask questions, it's pretty easy to do. If you are interacting with us today on a desktop, this is where you're going to find the question bar. There's not a chat, but there is a question. And we'd love for you to chat to us if you'd like or ask any questions with where that blue arrow is pointing. So please just press on that and, uh, and ask any question that you'd like. If you're participating today from a mobile device, you can use the question button at the bottom you can tell by the green arrow here, just click on that and chat where you're from, if you'd like, we'd love to know where you're from. And also any question that you may have, we will answer the questions throughout and we will also pick a few and we will answer them at the end. Joining us on our webinar today is Kim Weber. She is an IBCLC and a member of our amazing customer support team. She's also gonna be monitoring the questions and we'll flag a few for to answer at the end of the webinar. We also have Jill, Jill from our tech team who is with us today. So if you're having any tech difficulties, feel free to also type it into the questions box and she will respond. If you're watching this recording on YouTube, please post your questions in the comments below. You can also contact our amazing customer support team at support at lactationtraining.com. So let's dive in and take a closer look at what a lactation consultant is and how you can follow your passion and become one. If you decide to become an IBCLC, you will join more than 34,000 IBCLCs in over 129 territories and countries. Credentialing as a lactation consultant is offered by the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners. Take a look at their website, iblce.org. They have different regional offices depending on where in the world you reside or work. Review the requirements and the pathways to become eligible to take the IBLCE certification exam. What do you need to know? The detailed content outline or exam blueprint is based on surveys of IBCLCs in various practice settings around the globe. The outline covers all of the topic areas and the chronological stages an IBCLC needs to know in their work. LER courses cover the entire detailed content outline, and they are approved by LARC, which is the Lactation Education Accreditation and Approval Review Committee. That's the organization that evaluates and approves lactation consultant training courses. Sakita will review a few questions to ask yourself today. Sakita? Thanks, Angela. So listen, so, you know, notice the title is Being and Becoming. So this first section, I'm going to talk about what we do and how we show up in spaces as lactation consultants. However, Angela is going to talk about the skills a little, I'm sorry, the, the, the how to get there, right? So when she starts to talk about some of those things, and as you hear me say some things about some of the skills that are necessary, please take a moment and ask yourself, do I have these skills? Do I have the skills necessary to become an IBCLC? And you know what, if you don't, that's okay, because that's why we're here. We're gonna talk about where to get the skills. And as you think about where to get the skills, I want you to keep in mind that everyone's um, area is so vastly different. Some of us work in areas where there's lots of IBCLCs, some of us work in areas where there's not very many IBCLCs. So start to really think about these things and write them down. Um, because when I talk about skills, I'm just not talking about the hands-on 
the doing things. I'm talking about knowledge and I'm also talking about attitude. So we're gonna hop right in, but really keep these questions in mind. If you need to write them down so that perhaps maybe you can reflect on them at the end of the webinar or sometime in the future. All right, so what makes an IBCLC? I talked about skills. This is one that's critical. Really, competency is, is it for almost every single profession there is. It is necessary to make sure that you provide adequate and appropriate lactation support. So it, it really means that you have the ability, the knowledge, and the skill set to do a task and to do it successfully. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the gamut. Like right now, if you're new to the field, sometimes we begin as novice. Are you competent in that entry level novice? Because we don't expect that you've seen everything or done everything. After consistent practice, you move into along this continuum of becoming an expert, right? And so being competent that at the end of your training, that you have the necessary knowledge and skills to enter this field, whereas you are causing no harm, is so critical because that's what competency is all about. It's about doing no harm to the families that we serve. All right, culturally appropriate. I like this term. Sometimes you'll hear cultural, cultural humility. You'll hear lots of things you'll talk about. You'll hear cultural competency. I like to use this word culturally appropriate because I don't think that we can ever be competent. I don't think we can ever master someone else's culture because within cultures, there are subcultures. So when I say culturally appropriate, I'm talking about, you know, um, language. I'm talking about how language is important and how we tend to make sense of the world. So one of the things that I think about is cultural humility. And that really starts with us. It starts with this reflection. It starts with us reflecting on our own personal values and beliefs. And then, and I should say, it's a lifelong process where we are learning other people's cultures, but we starting off evaluating our own. And so with that being said, you just want to make sure, for instance, I'll give you an example, culturally appropriate doesn't speak English and you're giving them a set of discharge instructions or instructions on how to uh, maintain lactation or whatever there is, is that uh, language, is that, oh, are those directions, I'm sorry, in their language? And if not, what steps are you, uh, what steps are you taking to mitigate and to make sure that the person has the knowledge necessary? So I'm not going to dive way deep into what culturally appropriate is, but one of the things I do want you to keep in mind is, is sometimes when we use language, we'll say things like, oh, it's not in their culture to do X, Y, and Z. That's one of the things that's not culturally appropriate. You want to avoid saying things like that because you don't know unless a person tells you that that's their own personal experience. So, you know, cultures are not, not people are not these monolithic people that work in, that's in all of these settings and they're just all the same. So dispelling that is a part of being culturally appropriate. Once you become culturally appropriate, I think that you become a credible resource because sometimes people ask us things and we may not have the answer to those things. It could be because it's not even in our worldview, or it could be that we just lack the knowledge or um, wherewithal to, to, to be able to answer that question. So when you try to answer questions, sometimes people will go off of their lived experience. One of the things that I'm saying is, is when you become an IBCLC, you don't want to rely on your own lactation experience, your own lived experience with your patient population, all of those things. You want to rely on the evidence, right? You want to say, okay, I may not know the answer to this, but let me get back to you or let me check a few things out. So really and truly what I'm saying is being credible resource means that you are giving out information that A, coincides with the best evidence and that B, you know what you're talking about. All right. Credibility. Oh, I, I, I usually say this and I do want to I want to um, I do want to state this that.
Credibility is everything to our profession. We know that people are told things that sometimes are like, they told you that, right? When you lose credibility as a lactation consultant or supporter, it translates to other IBCLCs losing credibility. So it could be detrimental to our profession. And I just want I just wanted to add that in. All right, so some of the other things that we do, we are policy advisors, we are policy creators, we are advocates. And when I think about policy, a lot of folks are like, Ooh. and I, I'm like, we all should do that. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. Um, but IBCLCs, we sit at certain tables and we can be like, well, that policy sounds a little different. And how can we fix it? Because it's not serving certain um, areas in, our, in my work, right? Or certain clients. So with that being said, we can sit at tables and we can advise on policies. We can sit and listen to how policies are created. We can listen to the language of policies and advise on that. And then, you know, sometimes policy, some, sometimes people working in the sphere of any type of health related to um, birthing people, lactating people, or babies, sometimes they come from a policy background. And so there's so many policies that we can think about as it relates to lactation care and support that need a little bit of work, right? So if that's your strong suit, I'm like, that's one skill you can already check off the box. And if that's not, don't worry about it. Because at the end of the day, once we listen to policies and how they create it, that then in terms kind of feed how we advocate um, for our clients and how we advocate for the lactation profession. So when we think about advocacy, it's one of the biggest parts that we do as lactation consultants. And an advocate is simply a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. So even if you're not a policy advisor, so to speak, you can be that person at the table that's listening how to listen to how policies are created and sharing your own personal perspective. Problem solver and researcher. Problem solving is about 90% of what we do because each family has their own set of concerns, set of circumstances that kind of determines um, how we move forward. So when people call on lactation consultants for support, it's usually a request secondary to some type of problem or issue that usually someone else hasn't been able to solve for them or hasn't been able to support them in, right? So be mindful of, you know, like framing lactation consult concerns from this kind of one size fits all framework, because as we will learn, and as you may know already, is that one size never fits all. So we should really be problem solving from the individual level and thinking about the lens of the family and what they're saying and the concerns that they're sharing with you. And along with that, um, you know, being a researcher, remember I said sometimes you don't know everything, you have to go back and look up. And there's two ways to be a researcher in this field. Some people do academic or scientific research and they are uh, researchers, right? But I would go a step further and say any of us, and that still includes me myself, have to look things up. Some things that you don't see common, um, you will have to go back and look up because we're not, we're not all walking around with that, like these little evidence-informed policies in our head or we're not walking dictionaries. So we have to refer back to what the literature is saying. So we're all researchers um, in this field. High-level lactation care and skilled lactation care. When we talk about the level of lactation care, there is already work that's been done by Rebecca Mano, um, and there's a framework regarding lactation acuity. And the lactation acuity framework takes into concerns or considerations from the lactating persons, or mother's per point of view, or factors or risk factors in the infant's factors or risk factors. And it's kind of like almost like, to me, it's an equation. I try to put everything in an equation. But it's what are their risks for premature weaning? That's what this model is like. So when we talk about high-level lactation care, lactation consultants 
should be able to provide a level of lactation care that's a little bit different from um, someone who maybe just have had like um, a lactation education course, like it's the nitty gritty. So I'm gonna give you an example of, for instance, what I think is basic breastfeeding care. So someone who needs a little bit of assistance with like latch and positioning, when the infant and parent, um, neither one of them have any other issues. They just need a little bit of assistance, right? That's what I would say would be uncomplicated lactation care versus someone that's in the ICU who's on life support, which means they are intubated, they have a tube, and they have someone caring for them around the clock. That would be high level. And believe it or not, yes, we are called sometimes, particularly in hospital settings, to care for um, these types of people in these uh, high level situations, or someone who's returned to the hospital with mastitis and have had to have surgery. Like, what is the care after that? So that's what I mean. There's a, there's a level of care that there's an expectation that we can be able to critically think through these types of situations and provide the best care, quality, and evidence. So I'm gonna pause right here and I'm going to say to you, talking about someone who's intubated or on life support, that's kind of, that's not something that occurs all the time but it can occur, so I brought it up. So don't get anxious right now and be like, oh, I don't wanna do that, because depending on where you work, if you work out in private practice, you may never see someone in this situation. So, but I do want to say how critical uh, it is to build our knowledge and to be able to think about, okay, the brain, um, the brain is injured, what do we know about oxytocin and prolactin? Like, where is it stimulated from? That's a little hint that you can take for, for your next, uh, into your learning, but we have to know about the brain. So that's why I'm saying being skilled enough to really know that if a person has come out of the hospital and perhaps they have had a brain injury and they're working themselves up onto rehab, now you may be in contact with someone like that, right? So that's the type of skill I'm talking about. Essential and timely. One of the things, every time I, I hear the word essential, let me pause for a minute. I get like, oh, right? I get this, this is something that happens because we know that during the pandemic, essential became this real buzzword. And um, initially what folks thought were lactation consultants really, really weren't essential. But I would say, yes, we are essential. And we found out that during the pandemic, because babies still need to eat and people were still having children and they still are having children. And especially during a pandemic, we should be promoting and protecting the ability to provide human milk at all costs. We've also been through a number of shortages as it relates to infant feeding. And we really wanna you know, just acknowledge that we, we are essential. Look, people were calling on for relactation for all sorts of issues. So I'm not, um, you know, thinking about just all of the bonding aspects, all of the other things that comes along with lactation. Some people will kind of write it off like, oh, that's not a big deal. But yes, it is a big deal. Um, protecting the right or human milk feeding is really a public health, um, uh, public health a call to action. And public health, uh, from a prevention, a health prevention standpoint, that's what I was trying to get out. So we are essential. And it's important to know that when people need us, with, that we are timely, that we show up, especially because we're in a pandemic now. Um, it's not prudent and it's not acceptable to be like, oh, okay, I can't help you because of X, Y, and Z. When families need us, um, it is expected that if we can't provide timely support, that at least we can refer them to someone else who may be able to provide that level of support and that level of care. So I just wanna make it really clear that telehealth is, yes, telehealth is great. It is one of the things that's booming right now. But when you think about families who encounter problems, sometimes telehealth just, just doesn't work um, in some instances. And so we can miss some things with telehealth. It really prohibits our ability to use our other senses. So. 
Um, I just want to leave that there. I want to, you know, I could go really in depth, but I don't want to scare anybody about what it means to provide care right now, um, particularly still because we are in a pandemic, but just ensuring that we're timely. Because the one thing we know that is if a person does not have that timely access to skilled lactation care, that sometimes will break their experience in their lactation and breastfeeding journey. So when we are invited into people's homes, into their hearts, into their situations for assistance, we become what I like to call collaborative, collaborative care partners. Um, I love this phrase because what it says to the world and to the client that I am here collaborating with you. I am not the center. You are the center. You are the decision maker. Um, and we are both collaborating. So remember always that when you're called to assist families, it's the families and their partner's goals, as well as their fears, as well as their barriers that takes precedence over what your goals are for them. So what are you saying, Sakita? Well, I'm saying that we all know that the recommendations are clear about exclusive breastfeeding and chest feeding for at least six months. Uh, we know that, right? So we have to honor some people sometimes because they have barriers, they have fears, they have all of these other things. And we need to take that into consideration. We can't walk into situations like, yeah, I'm the expert. So yeah, you know, trust me on this. You should do X, Y, and Z, right? Um, we have to understand that we're collaborating in partnership and in agreement with that when someone seeks our assistance with their care, that we make sure we approach it in a manner that we don't overstep boundaries that are not meant for us to overstep. If you practice in that way, that's how you become trusted. And in all honesty, you become trusted to do no harm. You become trusted to be reliable, trusted to say, oh, you know what? I see you as a person and I see that we're in this together. I'm not higher than you. I'm not the expert. I am just collaborating with you to do what's best for you. And that's how you become trusted. Um, sometimes we go into clinical situations and we assume that there's this hierarchy, right? So I'm gonna pause and say, yes, you have the knowledge, the skills, the attitude to really handle these situations. However, and you might even be an expert, but when it comes to certain families, we are not the experts, they are. So to walk into and be like, yep, yeah, I'm the expert. I know all about this. I've been teaching breastfeeding, chest feeding for 15, 20 years. I'm gonna tell you how it should work. You, a person, you're gonna lose them right there, right? No doubt. Or when you go in to touch someone, you know what, they ask for latch assistance and you just go in and be like, okay, I'm just gonna hook the baby up, you know, cause I've seen this too. Um, let them tell you what type of latch assistance they need long before and always, always ask before touching someone. Remember, you're, you're a collaborating person. So that's how you become trusted. Um, the other thing I wanna say, the same thing about credibility, when a person lose trust in the profession, they will lose trust altogether and may give up or it may look bad for our profession. Person-centered care. So person-centered care, um, I hope it's not another buzzword for a lot of people because it, there is a definition that's provided by the Institute of Medicine and they define it as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that the patient values guide all clinical decisions. So I've talked a little bit about culture. I've talked about collaboration. I've talked about care, the type of care you deliver. Uh, I've talked about how communication works and that the person is the center of all of it. And if you want more information on person-centered care, because you will hear this a lot, um, and for some, it really does become a buzzword. But if you want more information, you can visit the Institute of Medicine's website, but really practice what this model looks like. And then that would further build trust with, between you and your clients and also within your community. 
And when you practice in this way, you can also build trust um, with other clinicians that work around you. All right, so I began with two questions. I'm gonna close this section with another two questions. Um, so Angela's gonna talk about some things. She's gonna talk about the different pathways. She's gonna talk about how to go about um, getting lactation education to sit for the exam. There are a few things that I want you to ask yourself. Um, you might be on the journey already, but before starting this journey or while you're on the journey, think about what pathway is applicable for your situation. Also think about what your local market is like. What does it look like? Are, are there areas saturated with lactation consultants? And I'm gonna tell you right now, no, there isn't. There is not, it is not, no area is just saturated. There is so much work to do and so many people that need service. So, but when I say your local market, I mean, are there many people that are in private practice? And if so, what does that look like in your area? Or um, are there job opportunities in your local hospital? or in a rural settings, wherever you may be, what does that lo local market look like? Do you have mentorship? So if there's a market, you might need some mentorship, right? So thinking about that. Um, and also how does training and getting the education and the clinical hours, how does that fit within your life and your lifestyle and your family and your work? So ask these questions, write these questions down. These are reflective questions. The more you're clear about these questions and how you're going to proceed with your journey, the more successful you can be. So, Angela, take it away. Thank you so much, Sakita. I also would like to remind you that the, we have a handout in the handout section, also on the GoToWebinar interface. And so if you would like to download that handout, you are welcome to do so. If you are watching this recording, please email support at lactationtraining.com and we'd be happy to forward it to you. Now the process of becoming an IBCLC can feel complicated, but I'm gonna break it down and give you a roadmap for yourself. First, you need to choose a pathway. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Each pathway has three components. The first component is education. The second is clinical hours. And the third is getting ready for the exam. So the first component is the health sciences education. It's a typical education for healthcare providers. There are eight post-secondary or university level courses and six general education subjects. You can find a full list of each of these 14 subjects on the IBLCE website. You can search for it or you can find it in that resource sheet. The eight university level courses are, and you don't need to write these down, but you can if you'd like. They are biology, anatomy, physiology, infant and child growth and development, introduction to clinical research, nutrition, psychology, or counseling skills or communication skills, and finally, sociology or cultural sensitivity or cultural anthropology. They can be online or in person, as long as the institution is accredited to provide the training. If you took these courses during your college career, they count, even if that was 20 years ago. LER partners with the Union Institute and University and Walden University to provide those basic courses. Both organizations are online. Now, the advantage of working with Union is that their program director is an IBCLC who's chosen the college courses which meet the IBLCE requirements. If you wanna get your bachelor's degree in maternal child health with a concentration in human lactation, take a look at Union. Another advantage is that both universities will accept federal financial aid if you're working towards your degree. The six general education subjects are medical documentation, medical terminology, occupational safety and security for health professionals, professional ethics for health professionals, universal safety precautions, and infection control and basic life support. Five of the six general ed courses can be taken through LER. The only one you'll need to search for is basic life support. In many countries, there is an in-person skills check for this training. I've heard of some organizations providing this training completely online. Check with your local resources. 
The guide provides general descriptions for typical courses in this subject area when you go to the IBLCE website. Please keep in mind that the IBLCE is an international organization. The names used in the document to describe the courses may not exactly fit the description of the course at your accredited educational institution. It's okay. IBLCE utilizes broad and general terms with the understanding that there's no universal description for a course in, let's say, clinical research, what that will cover. Why are these 14 courses required? The IBL IBCLC is a standalone credential, meaning you do not need another certification, degree, or license to practice as an IBCLC. Once you pass the exam, you will be an allied healthcare professional. The courses will help you to be prepared for your career, as well as to help you pass the IBLCE exam. Now, the second thing is the lactation-specific education. This is where LER has you covered. The education should be comprehensive and cover the IBLCE detailed content outline. IBLCE requires at least 90 hours of lactation education. Five hours need to be on communication skills. Our five-hour courses are specific to lactation and breastfeeding care to help you in your practice as a lactation consultant. You can choose which five-hour course and communication skills suits your needs the best. The third component is lactation-specific clinical experience. This can include in-person consultations, telephone consultations, or online breastfeeding and lactation care that supports breastfeeding and chest feeding families. It also includes lactation assistance to pregnant and breastfeeding clients and lactation education to families and or professionals. These hours need to be obtained in the five years immediately prior to applying for the exam. Now, how many of those clinical hours do you need? Well, that depends on your pathway. So here's this quick overview, and I'm gonna review more about each pathway in the following slides. So generally, pathway one is for health professionals and those who provide breastfeeding support through an IBLCE recognized breastfeeding support counselor organization. Healthcare professionals include physicians, nurses, midwives, dietitians, physical therapists, and speech pathologists, and others. Breastfeeding support counselors include those accredited through organizations such as LER, La Leche League International, and the Australian Breastfeeding Association. As of this presentation, there are over 40 organizations that have applied to IBLCE and are approved. Pathway 2 applicants must complete a comprehensive academic program in human lactation and breastfeeding through an accredited university program. Their education has both the didactic and clinical components and they require 300 clinically supervised hours working with breastfeeding families. Pathway three is a structured mentorship program between an IBCLC and the applicant. The IBCLC, or if there are several, all of them must be in good standing with IBLCE. Those who choose this program must have this pathway approved with IBLCE prior to beginning these clinical hours. Now, I understand that that is happening relatively quickly, like just a few weeks. A quick note, for those of you who have breastfed, chest fed, or provided human milk for your baby, the hours you spend nursing, pumping, and helping your friends doesn't count towards your clinical hours. Now, while 500 or 1,000 hours seems like a lot, there's a really good reason why. Each candidate needs to have the clinical experience so that they can provide competent care as an IBCLC. Candidates who are applying for the IBLC exam through pathway one need at least 1,000 clinical hours, as I said. So that candidate needs to be either a healthcare provider or working with a breastfeeding support organization. If you're a healthcare provider, this can be done in a hospital, birth center, clinic, lactation care clinic, or practice, or through an independent practice as a licensed or registered healthcare professional in a non-healthcare setting. For breastfeeding support counselor from an IBLCE approved organization, their hours can be earned in person or online. 
The location and type of support depends on the criteria provided by the recognized organization. The hours need to be counted on an hour by hour basis. Now, two important points about the clinical hours. One, it's important for you to document the hours as you accrue them. Be very detailed in case IBLCE chooses to audit your application to take the exam. They may want to see documentation such as a spreadsheet or other document where you counted your hours. And secondly, the 1,000 hours do not need to be directly supervised through Pathway 1. Now, Pathway 3 requires 500 hours of clinical experience. This is best done in a busy practice setting where you can work with many breastfeeding, chest feeding people and those who are providing human milk for their babies each day, such as a hospital or clinic setting. The hours count towards the 500 hours when you're actually working with families. Observation or orientation hours don't count. Remember that clinical experience is graduated. That is, it, stop, it starts with observation, then doing tasks under supervision, then completing tasks independently with the ABCLC nearby to ask questions and discuss situations. LER has an internship program with many sites around the United States. Reach out to support at lactationtraining.com and we can connect you with our clinical internship director, Amy Black, to determine if we have a site in your area. If not, we can give you suggestions on how you can work with your local hospital to facilitate that internship site. One thing Amy wanted me to mention in this webinar is that you can't start to count your hours until, until you have both, until both you and the IBCLC are comfortable with you working independently. Most interns will spend about 75 hours in orientation or observation before you can begin to, begin to accrue the 500 hours. Or take a look in your community to find a willing internship site or mentors. You may need to reach out to many people to find someone with the time, experience, and capacity to agree to be your mentor. It's important to find a good fit. Talk to others who've been through Pathway 3 to find successful strategies in finding a good mentor. Now, while this pathway does have an additional step or two, is it worth it? Yes, it is. Why? Well, IBLCE, when they were reporting that students, the student outcomes based on pathway, it seems that those students who follow pathway three score better on the IBLCE exam. I think that mentorship is really the key component. Learning from an experienced clinician is well worth the extra effort involved at the beginning of this pathway. Now, a lot of people are asking whether or not they can accrue clinical hours via telehealth during the pandemic. The quick answer is yes. The longer answer is paraphrased from IBLCE documents. They are from April 17th and October 6th, both in 2020. IBLCE will allow the use of technology if certain parameters are met. You'll need to pay attention to privacy rules and the code of professional conduct and the clinical competencies for IBCLCs. Another point is that there should be observation using technology with two-way synchronous audio and visual components. The focus is on the mentor providing mentoring and guidance to the applicant. Now this guidance has been extended until 30 September of 2023. It's important to read all of the IBLCE documents listed in the interim guidance. The link to the guidance is found in the resource document in the handout section of this webinar. Now I will say that I do know that we are in March as of this recording of 2023, IBLCE has not indicated whether or not that will be extended, but we will keep you posted. Just keep an eye on our social media. At LER, there are two ways to gather your lactation-specific education. One is the Lactation Consultant Training Program, or LCTP, which is the full 95 hours front to back. The other is either the Core or Bridge Program, they are designed to meet your education needs depending on your background and your previous lactation training. First, we have a comprehensive course called the Lactation Consultant Training Program. It's a 90 plus hour course, which is eligible for SERPs, CME, and nursing contact hours. It's intended for those who do not have any lactation education and they want to become an IBCLC. We have more than 35 of the most knowledgeable, experienced instructors who are practicing lactation consultants, researchers, and authors who teach in our courses. 
including Sakita and me. Our classes are economical. You can view them on a variety of devices, such as your computer, tablet, or phone. They're optimized for a computer, but they can be reviewed later when you're on the go. We've been educating people in person and online since 1990. We update our course information with the latest peer review evidence on a regular schedule, but we'll update sooner as new evidence emerges. Have a question for the instructor or want to discuss a concept with your fellow students? There are several ways to connect to get the answers you need. Students can meet and support each other along the way in a variety of ways. As of this as of this recording, we do have a Facebook group, and so that's one way that you can do it, but if you are one of our students in one of our courses. There are people who are IBCLCs in that group who can also support your journey. Upon completion of the 95-hour course, you're eligible to take the Certified Breastfeeding Specialist exam. The exam is included in the price. Once, you're pa once you pass, you are a Certified Breastfeeding Specialist. This is to recognize you for the level of education you have attained. Now, while this certification, with this certification, you can begin to collect your clinical hours towards the IBLCE exam. Now, if you're unsure where to start or you already have some lactation-specific education hours, then we have our core or bridge program to meet your needs. They have the same advantages as the LCTP course. Our initial course is called CORE because it will provide you with the core lactation education you need to understand what it means to begin supporting the normal course of breastfeeding. It is 52 plus hours of online education. It covers the basics such as anatomy and physiology of lactation, infant growth and development, supporting the preterm baby, medications and breastfeeding, and many more. At the end of the course is the Certified Breastfeeding Specialist exam. The bridge course is ideal for people who have basic lactation education components and need the additional 45 hours to qualify for the exam. Topics in our bridge course include legal and ethical concerns for the lactation consultant, infant feeding in disasters, breastfeeding the infant with medical challenges, case studies, and clinical skills videos. Now, if you're not sure where to start, if you're new to the profession, I would say the core course. Get your feet wet and see if becoming an IBCLC fits your goals. Our 90-hour course, as well as the core and bridge courses, are available in Spanish. Capacitación en Lactancia is our new website, which provides the same high-quality education found on LER in Spanish. At LER, we believe that access to high-quality lactation education should not be limited by those, to those who live in countries with high incomes. We recognize that in many parts of the world, the relative purchasing power of a local currency may make the cost of lactation and ex education inaccessible. As part of LER's commitment to increasing lactation training worldwide, our pricing is adjusted according to the student's country of residence. In alignment with our continued commitment to diversity, Lactation Education Resources is proud to announce our rising tide in lactation equity scholarship program designed to increase the number of black and Latinx and Hispanic IBCLCs in the United States. We recognize that one of the greatest obstacles to entry to the field is access, specifically demonstrated by financial barriers. LER will remove the barrier, will remove that barrier for rising tide scholarship awardees. We alternate these scholarships every year. You can find more information on our website, lactationtraining.com, forward slash rising tide. Our team is here to help you now and in the future. We have tech support open seven days a week. You can get your questions answered by experts in the field, and there's ongoing support for the next steps in your lactation career. For example, we made a connection one time with an instructor. A student had a question, they were developing a policy, and we, they reached out to our support forum and we were able to connect them with that instructor so that they could get further suggestions at creating that policy. So we're happy to provide those additional resources and support along the way. Thank you very much for your time today. Now, what questions do you have for us? Sakita? Yeah, Angela, it's been pretty quiet. Kim has really 
answered the few questions that's in the uh, question box. So I think, uh, well, actually a question came up that hasn't been answered and it says, what pathway makes more sense for a CBS? Pathway one or three? Great. Great. So I think it depends on your setting, right? It, what Sakita was talking about in the beginning of the webinar, what are the resources that you have in your community? If you have access to a mentor, someone who's willing to mentor you to become an IBCLC, then pathway three would make sense. If you don't have anyone, you know, many supports in your community and you would like to earn your hours, you've got opportunities. Let's say that there is an obstetric clinic close by who is happy to offer you additional support. Uh, to becoming a lactation consultant, and uh, it will allow you to actually work out of their office space or will allow you to do, let's say, a prenatal uh, breastfeeding education course, then maybe doing pathway one is the one that's best for you. Uh, Ella, as I mentioned before, LER is a recognized breastfeeding support organization, and we're currently in our pilot phase, but that is going to go wide here in just a few weeks. So please do reach out to us and we are happy to sort of walk you through the steps for either pathway one or pathway three, if you're a CBS. Absolutely. Someone else did ask a question about, you know, having a, a difficult time finding that mentor. And that is something which can be a challenge. It's helpful if you can look around in different communities, different areas in your community, such as WIC, hospitals, outpatient centers, birthing centers, milk banks. You can reach out to those organizations to see if there are any willing mentors for you. We also I, do have, oh, go ahead. No, I, before you, just, I want to say about the coalition groups or any type of uh, group. Some people call them coalitions. Other folks have other names for groups where there are like-minded lactation supporters who get together um, sometimes once a month to talk about the latest information, latest clinical practice. I mean, become involved is what I'm saying. If you want to get, um, you know, the mentorship or find your people, become involved. Seek out those opportunities. Even conferences. If you, if there's a conference that you know, it's going to be near you that's affordable. Try to center yourself around there where there are areas of these like minded groups of, of professionals. Absolutely. And, you know, do walk in and make sure that you, you know, present yourself well. You know, don't necessarily pass out your business cards everywhere, but just have conversations with folks during, during lunch or during one of the break times and just, you know, ask questions, be curious ask what the work that they're doing. And, you know, there are times when some people, they need help and they would love to have someone who can help them with some admin work in exchange for being uh, mentored by them. So there are ways to do it. And as far as the Pathway 3 program is concerned, you know, you do need some sort of lactation education before you embark on that Pathway 3 and before a mentor, frankly, may agree to take you on. I know that with our um, internship sites around the United States, they want the person to be done or pretty close to done with their certified breastfeeding specialist training or with that basic, you know, with that 95 hours of training. So do keep an eye on that and do make sure that you've got those things, in, you know, in place before you reach out to a mentor. Angela, there's a question. Do the 500 hours in Pathway 3 need to be monitored with the IBCLC in the room? for each appointment, or did I hear you say the hours don't begin until the mentor IBCLC is comfortable when, with you counseling patients alone? So it depends, do you wanna to respond to that? Or should um, I? You can, I can too, it doesn't, it does it, you know. I think that mentors uh, going into this situation, it's, it's kind of on you and both the mentor to really talk about uh, this clinical situation, but with a pathway three, you have to submit a plan of how you're going to um, be able to get your clinical hours with your mentor, and you have to sign that off with, with each other and then submit it, and then that has to be, I don't want to say okay, but you have to be given permission that this plan is a good plan. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, Angela might have some things to add to that as well, but, you know, I wanted to say that, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to have a pathway three 
um, mentor myself that I had to we had to let go because there were some live and learn um, parts of this. And um, when we think about clinical practice, the first thing as a clinician myself, I really want you to be sound and serious about this. So um, I, I expect there's a level of knowledge that you're already going to come with me um, and we're going to be able to build up on that. So it's really important to kind of get grounded in what your mentor really expects from you as a mentee and then also what you expect from your mentors. So I think that, that there's lots of room for kind of discussion and anticipatory guidance when you think about this mentor and pathway through relationship. Right, and it is important to have those conversations ahead of time. And, you know, as I said, it may take some time before they feel comfortable to have you. So does the person need to be in the room? IBLCE is not, doesn't say specifically, it, you have to meet these black and white parameters. They provide a wide, broad definition, and then you and the mentor need to take a look at that and then to interpret it on how you feel comfortable doing it. For example, um, I know that in my practice, when I've had interns, uh, whenever we would go into a, a client's home or a client, a patient room to Together, and I would do the talking at first and that's the orientation part where I'm doing the talking and they're simply observing and then as they feel more comfortable I feel more comfortable I know that they know it then we'll walk into a room together and they can start building rapport and start the conversation and ask the questions and I just sit there and I just watch and so they are the ones who are doing that work and I'm simply observing and there can also be opportunities where the uh, mentor is is busy with something else and someone needs, let's say, a latch check in a room. And if the intern and the mentor are comfortable with that, then the intern could go into that room and kind of get things started with the mentor following or an opportunity for there to be some sort of a, a debrief afterwards to ensure that all the different points are covered. And so that, you know, those are all different scenarios which may work for folks, but it really depends upon the mentor who's providing the guidance. There's a question that says, I'm an occupational therapist working in Canada and looking to start private practice using my CBS training under the title of OT. In the CBS scope of practice, it states that we cannot work with uncomplicated. I think you mean complicated. The CBS is for uncomplicated situations. How this, I'm further reading the question. However, I have some positioning, pediatric feeding experience that complements this training. How do I balance this gray area as I move forward? That is a phenomenal question. And there, that is a conundrum that we all experience in the lactation field. So I'm going to give you um, my spill to it and then Angela chime in. But, you know, one of the things that I recognize, I was an RN and a lactation consultant. And so I don't mix those two. I don't say I'm an RN lactation consultant. I am an RN and I am a lactation consultant. Reason being is because the scope of practice between the two are different. And I will say this, one of the things of being an RN, there were times when I would see a client who had clinical signs of mastitis. However, I could not diagnose those things because it was not within my scope of practice. So I never tried to merge any of those scopes of practice. I understood that if I'm, and, and as a birth doula and a former labor and delivery nurse, I know that when I'm walking into a situation, I am the birth doula. I am not the registered nurse. So it is a way of compartmentalizing and not really getting comfortable in merging them to make them a great area. That's what I would say would be the safest and prudent thing to do, because once we do that and start making our own rules, sometimes we get lost. So, for instance, if you're an OT and you're working on some oral things, great, um, and your CBS, awesome. But once it becomes a complicated lactation situation, then collaborating with an IBCLC or someone, wherever the scope, wherever the complexities fall within. Um, you know, it could be mastitis and you're OT, right? You want to be referring out to other um, providers. I hope that makes sense. Um, but Angela, chime in. No, that makes total sense. I think it's just a matter of being really transparent with the patient and letting them know 
that this is something which is lactation and this is something which best fits the work I do as an OT. And so just be really transparent with folks and let them know that you're flipping back and forth between the two and how fortunate they are to have all of you present in that consultation. So really just be transparent with folks and make sure that they're aware of it. And the reason why the CBS scope of practice talks about you know, uncomplicated cases has to do with the fact that we know what's in our training, right? Sakita and I educate, we train folks, and we review all of the content that we have. And so we know what you are learning. And so that's the reason why we say it's, it's you know, uncomplicated cases. And yet it's important, as Sakita discussed, that if you are out there in the community and when you come up with a complicated case and you're supporting a family as a CBS, it's important for you to, knew, to know who those resources are in your community that you can refer to. When there is something that is a concern, who do you refer to? And it is not if, it is when. Okay, uh, someone else has a question here. Pathway one, volunteering with La Leche League, will the September 30 deadline affect this pathway's clinical hours? They mostly support folks online and with telephone and they are not meeting in person. And so, and they're in the beginning stages of this pathway. Again, it depends on the breastfeeding support organization. And so I am aware that La Leche League International does allow for their counselors to support folks both online as well as by phone. That's sort of how things got started with La Leche League was in-person meetings as well as phone and uh, the old school form of texting called writing a letter. And so those are the ways in which you could gather hours as a La Leche League leader. So I'm very familiar with the organization. I was a La Leche League leader for 30 years. And so that's how I know that the answer to that question. Someone else mentioned that they were a leader um, during from March of 2020 through January of 22. And is it correct that Ibelsi made special circumstances for those years? I'm not sure if they made special circumstances. I don't know what that means. I do know that the hours uh, for breastfeeding support counselors was counted more as an aggregate before, if accrued before, help me out Sakita, if accrued before 2022, I do believe that people were able to get those hours sort of um, and count like 250 or 500 hours per year. And so you would need to check the IBLCE website for breastfeeding support counselors to find out what to do for those hours that you accrued before 2022. Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, way to kind of get the exact information because I, you know, like many people since March, 2020, I'm trying to keep up with a lot of changes in flexibility and fluidity with all of the organizations. And so um, the only thing I, I think that I was aware of was the telehealth change for a lot of things and the way we sit for the exam, there were some changes. But as far as uh, getting you know, um, your, your experience, I, I can't speak to that. Okay, that's great. I think we have all the questions covered here. So thank you every, everyone very much for joining us today. If you do have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us, support at lactationtraining.com. And, or you can also give us a call. We actually answer the phone or answer our voicemails, return our voicemails. So please do give us a call if you're old school and you do want to talk to someone. So thank you very much for your time today. Any closing comments, Sakita? No, I just want to say if you are in this area and you are passionate about this area, keep going, get clarification. Sometimes we need to hear this pathway talk a few times, revisit the, uh, the, the recording, whatever you need to do. And if you have uh, uh, questions that you need clarified or verified, please reach out, um, please reach out, but continue on your passion if this is it. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Bye, everyone. Bye.